mitigation conservative. So the kind of mitigation you see coming out of AfriForum, there are some scholars here at UP, at Northwest University, and other places who are anti-transformation conservatives. In other words, for them, the constitution should play a fairly limited role um, and should uh, in some way accommodate the interests of um, um, the, the previous um, ruling um, elite. Okay, so that we normally don't talk about anymore because they, as it were, uh, fell with, with apartheid. <laughs> Following these anti-transformation conservatives were uh, a group we might call constitutional optimists. This is really the group that occupies the most space in South Africa. These are the people who say we can't live without the constitution. By the way, that was said by Julius Malema. Um, these are people who say the constitution is transformative and it represents a fundamental and radical break with the past. And so for these are people who don't have a problem with the constitution. They see it very much as perfect and simply a problem of implementation and so, and so on and so forth. The third group I used to belong to are a group we might call constitutional skeptics. So these are uh, legal theorists, mostly academics, who are very skeptical about an over-emphasis and an over-worship of the constitution. They would argue that the constitution has deep liberal roots that need to be examined. They would argue that the constitution has deep Eurocentric roots that need to be examined. They would argue that the constitution and the law are fundamentally limited forms of social change. And those kinds of people would simply they don't have a problem with the constitution per se, but they would be cautious to over-celebrate the constitution. So these are the three dominant groups. The fourth group uh, is now the group I belong to. This is the group I would call constitutional abolitionists. For, for, for these people, the problems of the constitution are not about interpretation, they're not in the text, they are much more fundamental. They are about whether or not the constitution is the appropriate response to our history. So. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to set out aspects of this uh, constitutional abolitionist position. I actually have a shirt that says, I love the constitution, which I should have worn, uh, so that what I say goes down easily. I'm going to, I'm going to also start and close uh, with a quote by Steve Biko. Let's start. He says, if we have a mere change of face in those governing positions, what is likely to happen is that black people will continue to be poor, and you will see a few blacks filtering through into the so-called bourgeoisie. Our society will be run almost as of yesterday. Okay, so my answer to the question that's been posed to us, can the constitution heal history, can it regulate the present, and can it deliver a just future, um, is, is probably no, that's my answer, but it really depends on what your political and cultural standpoint is. Uh, and although my own answer is no, I want to map out some of the theoretical issues in the debate on the Constitution, and I'm going to number them, seven points that I'm going to talk about. Um, if they sound too scholarly and too academic, uh, that's because uh, they are. <laughs> so the first, the first is that a Constitution is principally concerned with forming the legal and political order of a society. So it's much more than a legal text. It's much more than a set of legal provisions and legal principles. Rather, it is the embodiment, or should be the embodiment, of the foundational norms, the governing values, and the national culture of a community, however diverse. And it should also represent something of that community's understanding of law, of morality, and of justice. So the text is a reflection of the constitution, but the real constitution is the larger governing order in a society. So a constitution is also a very hegemonic public vocabulary, a very dominant way of talking and thinking. It's a political imaginary. It's a form of historical and social consciousness. In other words, it shapes and limits, shapes and limits how we think and how we talk. It embeds certain cultural and ideological values and it works to consolidate and preserve some arrangements and some relations of power and not others. So in other words, it's a fundamentally ideological document and therefore opens up contestation. The second point. South African history from 1652 to the present is a history marked by surreal inhumanity and racial terror. This is a problem that predates apartheid, and the problem of colonial conquest was not only about legal and political discrimination and disenfranchisement, but it was about what we might call total subjugation through land dispossession and displacement of indigenous peoples by the invading settler population. It was about economic super exploitation, but it was also about psychic degradation, what most of you will know now as epistemicide, that is the destruction and devaluation of the knowledges, the cultures and the languages of the indigenous people. It was about spatial segregation, it was about psychological debasement, it was about erasing Africans from the very category of the human, it was about producing non-bees, producing foreign natives. 
Through this subjugation, a settler dominated and a white supremacist world was created. So an emancipatory constitution, when you say this constitution is an emancipatory or liberating constitution, it has to be judged according to whether it dismantles the fundamental roots of that settler colonial world, and whether it constructs one which restores not only the material dignity, but also the cultural and existential integrity of the colonized people. In other words, while we may have a post-apartheid constitution that incorporates African people who are now strangely called previously disadvantaged, the real question is whether we have a post-conquest constitution, a, a constitution that would terminate the very structure of white supremacy at the legal, political, cultural, and epistemological level. Third point, the legal end of apartheid should not be conflated with the end of white supremacy. Rather, since relations of power and domination can survive the dismantling of the legal system, White supremacy must be understood as a broadly political, economic, and cultural system in which three things are present. One, white people overwhelmingly control and have access to social power and material resources. Two, conscious and unconscious notions of white superiority and white entitlement are widespread. They are held mostly by whites, but also by blacks. Three, relations and images of white dominance and black subordination are reignited daily across a wide array of institutions, spaces, platforms, and social settings, both private and public. If these three things feature in any society, that society remains white supremacist, even if the constitution declares the society as non-racial, and even if that society is under black majority rule. Number four, by its very definition, a negotiated settlement or a political compromise means that the old order is accommodated, that is, kept alive, rather than abolished in the making of the new. A constitution that comes out of a negotiated settlement therefore cannot be called decolonial or revolutionary by any stretch of the imagination. Therefore, a negotiated constitution is rarely an occasion for celebration. Because what it means is that essential aspects of the political and cultural economy of colonial apartheid, in other words, land disposition, the assumed superiority of Western civilization, that is racism, spatial segregation, economic inequality, those essential aspects of the old order are allowed to live on in the new order and thereby reproduces a state of unfreedom. The freedom that comes with the negotiated settlement has been variously described as partial, limited, having no real effect, artificial, and illusory. A negotiated settlement, in other words, suspends the liberation struggle and prolongs the antagonism rather than definitively end it, so that what we have is the old South Africa still, which is to say white South Africa remains in place. A negotiated settlement avoids history rather than confronts it. And any statistic that measures inequality, social power, well-being, life expectancy, and the general quality and value of human life in South Africa will reflect that we are still living in the old South Africa. In fact, some statistics, as we know, point to increasing inequality, increasing social division, and deeply resilient colonial structures. So many people will say this is the fault of the government. I will argue also that it has to do with two other things. One, the fact that law and constitutions are structurally limited. But secondly, it has to do with these faulty historical, ideological foundations of the present constitutional orders. And the faultiness comes out of the fact that this constitution is really the culmination of the philosophy of the Congress tradition, of the ANC, um, and, 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 and the Charterist tradition. So let me be clear, it's not that change has not happened in South Africa, that would not be true. It's that the form of change is not capable of dislodging the structures and practices that were created by colonial Congress. Number five, transformative constitutionalism and human rights activism can only ameliorate, that is, only slightly make better, rather than eradicate the root causes and conditions of injustice. So a constitution can help to prevent evictions and a good, well-trained, social justice-minded lawyer should always be willing to uh, prevent eviction, but it cannot prevent homelessness. And it cannot more fundamentally confront the order of racial capitalism that produces homelessness in the first place. So the surrounding political economy, the surrounding dominant knowledges in a society constrain and can even render hollow the meaning and promise of a constitution. Number six, the crisis of the black legal scholar today 
is that there is no sustained development of a truly black tradition of legal analysis and intellectual practice. It is an, by now an open secret that the academic study and knowledge in areas such as equality, land, constitutionalism, memory, transitional justice, socioeconomic rights is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly characterized by white hegemony. This white epistemic authority, this overrepresentation of whites in these areas, works to define the intellectual problems and questions of the disciplines. It works to validate what methods and perspectives are allowed and not allowed. And therefore, it sets the agenda, which is to say that it constructs the reality largely on the basis of Western paradigms that privilege what we might call socially white accounts of the world. So we have this challenge that the very questions and the very answers about the future of South Africa are already prefigured by the fact that there is no seriously strong tradition of black legal thought and of black radical uh, legal thought in South Africa. This is something that would have to be addressed. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because we, we must remember that for a long time in South Africa, really beginning for me in, 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 in the early 1900s, but at least definitively in the 50s, there were really two, well, there were many, but there were two dominant positions that came out of the Black Liberation Movement of South Africa around this. The one is the one I've pointed out to, is the Congress tradition. Now, the Congress tradition has, to me, a very scary history. Um, and you should uh, read Tembega's book for some of that scary history. This is, in other words, uh, Africans who believed that they should be treated like white people on the basis of meeting certain requirements of civilization set by the European colonial law. These were Africans who at some point decided under some uh, white intellectual leadership that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. Uh, this happened miraculously in, in the 50s. But I want to remind people that this was not the only tradition. Alongside this tradition, and not, not simply with the formation of the PAC in 1959, but even before the 1900s, always in a struggle, there was a much more radical tradition. A tradition that took issue with South Africa itself as an artifact of colonial sovereignty. So the point was not to simply democratize South Africa, but to decolonize, that is to end South Africa. So the fact that we still keep the name that this place was given by its colonial conquerors tells you something more than that about just the name. It tells you who really rules the country, who really rules the nation. So the point is just to remind you that we, this was not the only answer to the question of 1994. There were other answers, and increasingly we need to go back and revisit some of those answers uh, as they come from the Azanian tradition. The final thing I want to say is that constitutional worship, which I also take to be the most dominant pervasive way of approaching the constitution, constitutional worship, is a very unhealthy habit in a, in a robust democracy. It limits our ability to confront deep-rooted historical problems, and it weakens our maturity um, to deal with difficult conversations. We are now in a moment of decision or a moment of crisis in South Africa where the very foundations um, of South Africa are, are in question. And so, although the good advocates and good judges should continue to use the constitution productively, they should also leave those of us who are working towards something else, something bigger, something more <laughs> abolitionist. <laughs> so, let's, so those are the seven points. I'm just going to close with another book by Pico, which aptly describes, uh, in my view, the state of the country. This is where he was criticizing integration as a form of change. The myth of integration, Pico says, as propounded under the banner of liberal ideology must be cracked and killed because it makes people believe that something is being done when in actual fact the artificial integrated circles are so foreign on the blacks and provide a vague satisfaction for the guilty stricken whites. It works on a false premise that because it is difficult to bring people from different races together in this country, therefore achievement of this in itself is a step forward towards a total liberation of blacks. Nothing, says Biko, could be more irrelevant and therefore misleading. Those who believe in it are living, and this is what I think South Africa is, says, those who believe in it are living in a fool's paradise. So in the early, the mid 90s, the TRC had this wonderful slogan, no future without forgiveness. I would say no future without justice. Thank you.
will speed up the pace of the, of the revolution with the next speaker. Good evening, all of you. Um, it's very difficult to be the contract lawyer after all of that. <laughs> Um, okay, so, is that fine? Okay. Um, in terms of healing history, I mean, it's very difficult in my space or in my work or in my teaching to tell you that the Constitution is, it, it works, it's healed history or not. I live in a very practical sphere in terms of I, it's commercial litigation, it's, it's purchase and selling, it's, it's, you know, things, documentation, admin that I do all the time. I accept the Constitution. I accept the values enshrined in it, I accept it as a founding document for the new South Africa, but I also know it has a lot of problems, and I see those problems in the work that I do. There's inequality, there's injustice, there's discrimination, there's poverty still today. And those are things that I'm faced with not only as, as a practitioner, but as, a, as an educator, as somebody who teaches a wide range of students from different backgrounds. Um, the values contained in the Constitution is mostly, for me, um, you know, it's a dream, right? It sounds great, but the reality of life is a nightmare for a lot of people. So I can see that in, in all the work that I do, um, especially at the university when I see students from such different backgrounds who have issues like finance, who have issues like transportation, who do not have, um, who just do not have the resources to make it in, 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 this, in this field. And I think that's the reason why you find Joel and Krav and myself in this space, trying to educate a generation, trying to mentor a generation to do better. And from industry, from construction industry, from your commercial litigation, for me, I've seen inequality on the ground. I've seen inequality in industries and business relationships and business negotiations. I've seen instances on site where um, local communities were promised the world and were promised skills development, and that's the reasons why many of the enterprises got those contracts in the first place, but didn't actually uplift those communities. And they were left, you know, they, they weren't, they, there wasn't hardly any economic growth. Um, jobs weren't created, dreams were sold, but it didn't actually happen in reality. Um, and something that I've never been able to wrap my head around is you know, it's things like the FIFA World Cup that didn't really benefit the average South African on the street. Um, did we still paying off? But in the kind of sphere where I get to, you know, teach contract law, I try and incorporate those values of where, where do we go from here, where to from here, because we have some sort of foundational document. Our, you know, the generation before us has done this. They have fought that fight for us, and what do we do next? And I think sometimes it's important to look at the man in the mirror and say, what are we doing as a generation to change things? Are we actually contributing to it, or are we just talking about it? Excuse me, talking about it. By that I mean, how many of you actually go out and vote when you get the chance to vote? Somebody fought for that right to vote, and most of the time it's an inconvenience because it's kind of a public holiday, so <laughs> nobody really wants to do it. But it's those kinds of things that we take for granted in society. I mean, you know, I, I have friends who say, oh no, but it's a public holiday, what do you mean vote? So, it, it happens all the time. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is judicial redress and in terms of going to courts and having a court decide a matter or to decide a dispute. Your legal representation is as good as, or the quality of it is as good as your financial resources. So as much as we can talk about access to justice or access to litigation or access to courts, you need funding to do that. You need money to go to court. That's the reality of it. And to continue going to court, you need even more money. And the, and that's the saddest thing, is that you only get the quality of senior counsel or, or great attorneys or, or ENSs and Norton Roses if you have the money. How many South Africans actually have that? And not only in terms of the price of legal, legal services, but what about the quality of the legal professional themselves? The ethical duty of lawyers, the ethical duty of advocates to advise clients properly to, to do the right thing, to um, not try and build them forever and forever and forever until kingdom come but to also get the matter done and sort it out and to have that kind of value and integrity as a person. Um, and in terms of discrimination, um, you know, and, and all of these things, uh, the Constitution talks to the fact that there's a right to equality, there's a right to integrity, freedoms, and so forth. But what about the, what about the girl that wants to have an abortion and has to go to a clinic where she is treated you know, with the utmost disrespect by the clinic staff who should be assisting her? And that's what happens on a daily basis and in daily life. So, 
In the university perspective as a lecturer and, a, and as a practitioner, what I try and do is impart that knowledge to you that you will become good lawyers or you will become good citizens. You will do the right thing. And the student who studies hard and works hard deserves to have a future. We tell you that all the time, but then when you get your degree, you can't find a job. And you can't find a job and you've got these student loans to pay. And the reality is that your student loan doesn't go away while the constitution is not doing or doing what it's supposed to do. You still have to pay that every month. And you know, with our, with our unemployment rate going up to 30% right now, if you don't pay any, if you don't get a salary, you don't pay taxes. The economy doesn't grow. And that's the reality of life. It's run by the financial markets. Um, but, uh, you know, we as, as a university, and I think the younger staff, the younger generation, the people of color in the department, and our, and our institution is changing. It's, it's not as fast and it's not as effective, but it is changing. We try and assist the students because I know the value of a black child looking at someone like me in an intellectual hall. I know the value of someone seeing someone like me teach someone and seeing that they can have some sort of future. Um, and, I, and I'm not the philosopher, and I think most of you who I've taught will say the same thing. But I try my best in what I do and in the space that I'm given to try and support you. But I'm also talking to the, the good student, not the student that gives me fake signals. Okay, I'm talking to the student that actually comes to class, not the student that says, oh, I was there and you don't even know my name. Okay? <laughs> and, you know, I'm talking to the student, uh, the guy who went to the gynecologist, and, you know, uh, we get all kinds of signals here. So, <laughs> so but I was speaking to Karabu in the day, and, we, and, I, and I told her this quote, and she said I was actually saying the quote. So we've ended what I want to say. I say the Constitution is like an ex-boyfriend. So, you, you know, you know, your heart gets broken. <laughs> so, you, your heart gets broken, you know, because of this, you know, of a relationship, and, and you're really, really heartbroken. But you never, ever give up on the dream. You never give up on the love. And I think that the Constitution has served whatever purpose it has, but our generation needs to do something else. They've done their part. It's up to us, and you don't lose that dream. You don't lose that love. And, and I still have that dream. You know, as naive as it sounds, I'm, I'm not naive to realities. But we'll see. But it, I, yeah, so I said it. <laughs> but thank you so much.